Do you feel lucky to have avoided going to jail or do you feel regretful that the, the brawl in the Commons just over there has really ended your political career? Yeah, I feel regretful about the whole incident. You think about the people that were affected by it, of course. Um, I'm certainly lucky not to have gone to jail. Um, people could have done it in those circumstances. Um, I think, broadly speaking, the punishment probably suited the crime. And you do feel remorseful? I largely do, but um, I'm not entirely sure I feel as remorseful as I should, which is probably not that healthy, but that's the fact of it. Just take us back to the night in question and what actually happened that night. The whole thing happened because I'd been drinking and was being quite fighty, which is not unique in my own personal history. So do you get quite fighty, as you put it, quite often? No, not really often, but, you know, on occasion. Um, in the past, I have been, you know, of a fairly physical, you know, nature, and it's never been related to alcohol particularly. It's just that I've been quite quick to pile in. Why do you think it is that you seem to have been unable to refrain from punching people on numerous occasions? I think there's a natural truculence I've never dealt with. It seems to me in society at large it's okay, by and large, behaviourally, to you know, damage people's careers. And, but when it comes to a bit of physical contact, then that's, that's a dreadful thing that's more shocking than anything people can imagine. I think other people, you know, perhaps more working class people, you know, in parts of cities and towns across the country would see things quite differently. So maybe that's a question of how mores uh, are, you know, set by the middle classes who generally shy away from physical stuff. So in a way, you're saying that you defend occasionally punching people. I think there is room for a bit of consensual, uh, low-level violence. I think if a couple of guys want to have a fight outside a pub and they do it behind the pub and nobody else is there and nobody's getting seriously injured, then I really don't think that's a matter for the police to get terribly involved. People can have consensual sadomasochistic sex and that, that's allowed. Um, so it seems to me it broadly fits into the same bracket. Do you think you've always been quite a kind of angry person or do you think there was a particular trigger, whether it's back in childhood, whether it's the stress of being an MP or, you know, the disappointment of not getting a government job? Yeah, these little disappointments come along in life and shake your, if not your confidence, they shake your um, sense of, you know, what, what am I doing this for? What's the point? You know, and maybe the way that you... Uh, compose yourself and the way you the way you behave. You said in your common statement that your standard of conduct in the bar over there mm. was egregiously below the conduct expected of an MP or anyone anywhere. Mm. But hearing you talk now about how you know it's sort of okay to have a fight now and again, I'm not sure whether I quite believe that. I used the word egregious, so people might think I was vaguely intelligent about that. So, yeah, uh, uh, the you quite wanted to sound a little bit pompous. Uh, yeah, well, I think pomposity has its place. Um, but seriously, the um, behaviour in the strangers' bar was shocking because, you know, putting me in a situation with all these people who had probably had fairly genteel lives in the past would be, for them, a relatively shocking experience. I don't doubt it, but, you know, when I'm talking about things that happen on Saturday evenings with a couple of guys, you know, who have been out for a drink kind of thing, I think that's a very different thing. But how much do you drink, do you think, on a... Or how much were you drinking then on a regular basis every day? I wouldn't locate the whole issue of what happened and what I did uh, in the realms of alcohol. But I think it's just as much, if not more, to do with my own um, preparedness to be physical in the past. But clearly that's something I have to try to do something about. You may say I should have done something about it before now. But you know, I did have a crack at one point. You did have a crack at doing something about it at one point? I did actually. I went on a course in, uh, in the States, in Arizona. Um, an anger management course? Yeah, I did get involved being reborn out of a carpet um, and I'm not sure that was the right course for me. Well, you've got a twinkle in your eye when you say all this. I mean, do you, do you think you're in denial about the scale of the problems? The horror. Um, so you said that in a... Are you laughing because it's the easiest way to deal with it? I'm not sure I'll ever um, properly accept the values that are supposed to be accepted by everyone in modern society as conveyed to us through the media. And, and that's part of the problem I have, I guess. I've not really fitted in massively well in, in, in as a politician and, and that'll be part of the problem. Do you think you've never learnt the difference between right and wrong then? In some ways probably not. How old were you when you started stealing cars? 14. Did you get a thrill from it? What, racing cars around like maniacs? Yeah, I, we got a fantastic thrill from it. Something you couldn't really replicate through you know normal hobbies and clubs in the evening. How many cars did you steal? Loads. Um, so there are numerous times when you nicked a car, crashed it or whatever? And 
to this day, no one knew that you did it? Yes. N numerous, yes, of course. I think that's probably normally the case with minor offences. I think, you know, when people get caught for a minor offence, they've done it many, many times before. Do you feel terrible about that? No. No, not really. Well, I'd feel, you know, it's not, I'm not going out stealing your car. Your car is safe wherever it's parked. Um, it, it's a long time ago, and I, you know, I can't look back to things I did when I was 14 years old. Uh, in spite of the fact that some of my old teachers write to papers and say he was a badly behaved boy at the time, I think that's a bit bizarre. I was only 14. Are you exaggerating any of this? I mean, a lot of people might not believe that someone who sits over there in the House of the Parliament um, you know, has nicked a whole load of cars and never got caught for it. Um, no, I think, I mean, the funny thing is you get very isolated across, uh, isolated is not quite the right word. Members of Parliament actually know the streets in their own constituency fantastically well. And they go into all sorts of people's homes and people often think it's an ivory tower. Well, not on a Friday's when they're in their constituencies, they're doing the opposite. Um, but the idea that, you know, 30 or 40 or 50 cars would be a lot, I mean, there'll be kids out there who've stolen hundreds. The idea that, you know, X amount of fights is a lot. There'll be people out there do it all the time, you know, and it, there's a kind of strange uh, disconnect between wh how people think people behave uh, and how it actually is on the ground. I mean, I don't think people would be surprised and shocked that someone who stole cars when they're 15 or 16 knocked off quite a lot. I think they'd go, oh, yeah, I'd expect that. Let's just talk um, finally on this kind of section about um, Meg Lauder, the 17-year-old who you were accused or it was allegedly you had an affair with her. What how would you describe your relationship? Oh, she was working for me uh, on, on a campaign, um, and she was great. Um, it was probably too close in the sense that she was in my flat a couple of times. Um, beyond that, the rest is kind of particular story in Scotland was, was, was essentially made up. Do you, do you accept, though, that allowing a teenager, effectively, who worked for you into your flat, that was an error of judgment? Yeah. Not my only error of judgment, not my greatest, but it certainly was, unquestionably. What's your greatest error of judgment? Do you know, it's quite a competition for that. If I was to line up my greatest misjudgments, um, I don't know, it's, it's like, you know, it's, the, it's an Olympics year, so I don't know what my gold medalist would be, but there's a bunch. But just going back to um, Meg Lauder, do you, was there a sense in which you knew you were doing, you were flying close to the wind, sailing close to the wind, I should say, and you had sort of stopped caring whether you got caught or not? Not really, uh, to be perfectly honest, no. Um, I've had a number of relationships Funnily enough, um, with women, uh, which haven't been like sexual or anything, and I've been far too familiar, and have probably given people the wrong impression, and it all piled up when this uh, when these stories came out. When I you know, did the thing in the strangers bar, there's a bunch of people came out with stories that were news to me. Um, but when I looked at it, I'd kind of put myself in a fairly vulnerable position by being friendly and informal and chatty, and people had told me that before actually. Or do you find it easier to talk to women, young women? Not especially. No, I think it, there's a naivety in, particularly as an MP, you have all sorts of layered relationships, not many more so, I guess, than the other professionals, but the fact is you do. Uh, and there's, an, there's the public element and the private element and the bit in between. And if you don't get those layered relationships right, you can come, you know, come off rather badly. And I think that's, that's, that's essentially where I was. You've admitted to punching people numerous times, drinking far too much, and yet you're an <coughs> MP, you're a serving MP. You know, people see MPs as something, a kind of rightly or wrongly, a pillar of the establishment. Mm. Do you think you should still be an MP at this moment? I'm not even sure I'd want to be an MP and a pillar of society. I, I'm not sure, you know, I'm not a local, I'm not a bishop, I'm not, you know... A yeah, but there's a middle ground between being a bishop and, and being I'm not a, a moral. I'm not a moral example, I don't think it's the rule. I know people would say very differently. They may say that ministers and government members, maybe, would, should be somehow exemplars. I'm not sure about the whole exemplar thing. I think if you go down that road, you start to have to make quite significant value, value judgments about individuals and what you want to see in other people. You've been in the army, you've been in Westminster, and now you're contemplating life on the outside. How do you think it's come to this? It's a question of not fitting in terribly well, of allowing um, my self-discipline to slip. Um, of having not really fully appreciating the same, quite the same, not quite synchronising my values with those around me. And I, I accept that that's a failing of mine. I mean, being a little more orthodox, you know, is generally quite good for your career. Do your friends fear that you're self-destructing? Yeah, that would be fair. Well, yeah, m probably most people do think that.
I didn't feel to me that that's the case, but um, the evidence is not looking good.